Hi, everybody. Welcome to my signature tying session tonight. Thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Devin Olson. I am an Umpqua signature tire. I also uh, am a member of Fly Fishing Team USA, and I run a fly shop uh, called Tactical Fly Fisher, which you can see right here. Um, so yeah, tonight we're going to be tying up a few of my signature patterns, and I'll be here for a uh, question and answer period in between patterns and uh, after the segment a little bit. So the first pattern we're going to be doing tonight is one that I have. Uh, it's just a new color of the blowtorch that I have coming out this year, and that's the Hair's Ear Blowtorch. So we'll uh, get started rolling on that. Let's get started tying this Hair's Ear version of the blowtorch. So I have a uh, size 16 jig hook in the vise and a 2.8 millimeter slotted tungsten bead. You could also do that with an inverting tungsten bead as well. And you can use the same size hook if you want, a 16 or a 14 is what I tend to fish this pattern the most in. But uh, you can vary the bead size if you need to to get more weight as well. That same, this same uh, hook could take a 3.3 mil bead or even a 3.8 if you need it to. So I'm um, just uh, tying on some ADOT Rusty Dunn Uni thread. And I'm gonna hurry and cover most of the shank. And next I'm going to add three strands of Globrite number seven. So fluorescent Globrite floss. And number seven is kind of their lighter shade of fluorescent orange, almost like a sunburst shade. Um, and you could try other shades with this variation of the blowtorch as well, but this is the one that seems to match it the best for me and that I've had a lot of success with. So I just cut one long strand of this material and then I went ahead and matched up their ends and uh, now I've got three strands and I'm just gonna make a pinch wrap. So I'll put that thread in between my fingers right here pinch with my fingers, wrap around, and then pull up to get tension. And I can slide those fibers back so I don't really have to trim them off. All right. And then I'm gonna trim that tag really quite short. You'll see that it's about even with the bend of the hook. Um, the number one mistake I see on blow torches when most people time is they either use too much tag material or they make the tag too long. Uh, this is supposed to be a hot spot, but uh, you know, kind of a trigger point, but it's not supposed to be uh, a big overwhelming um, tail that, that just kind of takes over the fly. So now I'm gonna make a dubbing loop and I'm not gonna put any dubbing in this dubbing loop. I'm gonna use this as uh, ribbing. So I've got some, I've got my Stonfo um, rotary dubbing loop tool here. And I'm gonna make that dubbing loop, pull it to the back, and kind of just hang that dubbing loop on the back of my vise on one of the knobs. And now I'll go back up just a little bit again and put the, this is pearl sulky tinsel. And I'm gonna put this on the near side of the hook. And the dubbing loop thread went on the far side of the hook and I'll explain that the reason why in a second. All right, so now I have some hair's ear dubbing and you could use any type of hair's ear you, you want. Um, this happens to be a hairline hair's ear, but uh, we've got fast snow scruffy dub, we've got trout line mad rabbit and a whole bunch of uh, different types of hair's ear type dubbing in the shop. We also have some squirrel dubbing from uh, some UV tracer squirrel dubbing from uh, Nature Spirit. And um, there's lots of good options out there, but original hair's ear is just fine. And I've dubbed a little bit of a typical dubbing noodle on here. I want just enough to cover about three quarters of the body on here. I wanna leave a little bit of space for the CDC hackle and a collar up front. Now, there's some guard hairs that are hanging out here that are a little too long for my taste, so I've just trimmed them off. Um, and I'm gonna wrap this 
pearl sulky tinsel. I want this tinsel to go, uh, if I'm looking at the front of the fly, let's say, I want this to go counterclockwise. So basically the first wrap, it's gonna go underneath the hook. And that's why I wanted it on the near side because I want that first wrap to go underneath the hook so that if fish take that, it's a little bit more durable. If it goes over the back of the hook to begin with, like up top here, then it's usually more um, prone to get broken by fish's teeth. So by putting it under the hook, it tends to shield it a little bit. Now, I'm gonna take the dubbing loop tool and spin it. And I'm using this as counter rib. So you could use some monofilament for this, but I've actually found that the thread is more durable than monofilament, which also tends to get cut by teeth. Because one of my main goals in tying any fly is to have it as durable as possible and to help it to last as long as possible. So that's what I'm doing with this thread here. I've spun it in that dubbing loop, so it's double layer, and then it's really bound up tight, and it is very durable. All right, so now the sulky is counter-ribbed and that should last as long as you have that fly. I'm gonna now just take a tiny little pinch of more dubbing and make a little bit of a dubbing ball. And what that's gonna do is help flare out the CDC hackle here a little bit. And now I've got a CDC feather and I need to prepare this feather a little bit. So I stroke the feather down like that and splay the fibers out. And then I'm gonna cut the base off the feather on both sides, the really webby stuff at the bottom. Because if that gets trapped in there, it tends to really overdress the fly. And then I'm actually gonna also cut about half of the fibers off on one side of the, the feather as well, so that I don't have very much left. And that will make it so I can make a couple turns of the tackle without it getting overdressed. Then I just stroke those fibers again uh, all except at the tip, tie the tip in. I'll cut that waist tip out. And then I'll take my hackle pliers here and make a couple of wraps. If you wanted, you could do this with a rotary function, but it's only a couple turns, so it's pretty easy to just do it standard rotation. So the way that was looking, I made actually about two and a half wraps. And it's probably slightly overdressed to my eye, but if I'd gone <laughs> one and a half or just two wraps, it looked slightly under. So um, this still looks pretty good. If I have to, I can go in and just trim a few of those fibers out. And then I'm uh, once I've tied that down, I'm just gonna put a couple of thread wraps back into the fibers a little bit because I wanna really bind that down, the quill itself. The quill is you know, a fairly fragile part of a CDC feather. So if I can put some thread wraps over the top of that quill and bind it down, it'll protect them a little bit and keep them from uh, falling apart. And then the last step to the fly here is to just add a little more dubbing. Now, I'm adding some more hairs here, but you could easily add some different dubbing here for some contrast or another hot spot. Um, UV pink ice dub works well. Uh, peacock black ice dub works well. There's lots of different dubbings you could try here. So it doesn't have to just be hairs here, but that's what I did on this one. You could also just try a different color of hairs here, like a darker one for a little more contrast. Now I'm gonna uh, add some super glue to the thread here. And I'm gonna make two or three wraps with that, and then grab my whip finisher and do three turns with the rest of the super glue on there. And what that does is it puts super glue under the whip, whip finishes and then throughout the wraps, and that will keep that whip finish from coming apart pretty much forever. And I could leave the fly as is right now, but the, the hackle is just a little, a little too Shaggy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it out of the vise and I splay the fibers, kind of trap them under my right hand. And then I come in 
and use my left thumb and index finger and kind of break those fibers off about even with the back of the hook. And now you'll see that I have soft tackle that's about the right length, kind of even with the back of the hook and nice and spread around. It is a little too overdressed for me, for my liking. So I'm just gonna trim a couple of those fibers up top off. And that's the finished hairsier version of the blowtorch. Uh, this is a great fly um, all year long for me, all winter. And uh, uh, I've been using it a lot during the, the winter this year and last year. It, fish, it fishes really well with a pink bead uh, in the winter a lot, a metallic pink bead. Uh, so that's another version or slight variation of this to try. But I hope you go out and, and give it a go on your local water and that it uh, works really well for you. If the blowtorch itself has worked for you, I'm sure this one will. And this one also tends to work really, uh, really well during caddis hatches for whatever reason. Um, it, you know, whether it looks like a pupa or not, they seem to take it during that time. So give it a go during the summer also. Um, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. So I hope that you enjoyed this fly and that you give it a, a, a go out on your local water. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me answer a few of the questions we've been getting in here. And I apologize if we don't get to yours. We've got uh, three separate feeds with questions coming in on all of them. So there's a bunch of them. Uh, let me go through a couple of the first ones that have appeared here. So. Uh, what bead color am I using on this blowtorch? Looks to be copper, um, and it is. And they said it appears to be kind of a matte in color shade. It, it, it isn't. It's just a regular copper bead that we sell in our store at Tactical Fly Fisher. But I think it was just the lighting that I was filming it under that maybe made it look that way a little bit. Um, and then <clears throat> when I'm designing flies, how big uh, or how do you decide what color bead to use on a fly? And how big a difference do you think that makes? So uh, for this, um, I kind of do it by eye. Um, my, there's no real, you know, set logic or anything behind it. I tie flies with and just kind of imagine them in my head beforehand with the color scheme that uh, I expect them to come out as. And there are certain patterns that look better with silver or copper for me or, or light pink or whatever. Um, I don't use a lot of gold beads in most of my flies. Uh, Mainly that's just because it's sort of a, something that a lot of competitors don't do. Um, simply because I guess we feel they're too bright or there, there's a lot of gold beads that get fished out there. So I, I fish mostly copper, silver, and light pink. I would say that makes up the bulk of mine. And I just pick one of those three colors that, that looks the best. And then I occasionally experiment with others as well. Uh, so on really dark flies, especially black, I tend to like silver beads with, with a black fly, but on uh, most lighter flies, tans, olives, or brown, uh, well, yeah, or browns. Uh, I like copper beads. <clears throat> and then um, I like metallic light pink beads a lot uh, to just try as well. A lot of times I'll tie the same fly with multiple bead colors and I'll just try on the day what works best. Um, and that, that tends to be the best way to go about it. Um, everybody always wants a, uh, you know, a set program or a set formula that I have for choosing the fly or choosing the color of bead for this or that, but it's trial and error. And the more trial and the more error you have, the usually the better combinations you can make. Okay, um, do I use a pink bead with an orange hotspot? Yeah, I do. Uh, so I'll use that light pink bead up front and then the tag in the back will be this. Everything else about the fly will be the same as I just tied it, but just with the light pink bead. Um, Let's see, let me scroll through some other questions here. So Kurt asked me, can I contrast this with my crossover nymph and do you add CDL tails sometimes to this? So um, that actually dovetails with a question uh, earlier on where I was asked what made me come up with this fly. So the, originally I, um, I had started tying the crossover nymph, which is basically this fly, but with a CDL tail or coccoleon tail over the tag. And I was using that as a uh, calabatus nymph in lakes. Um, but I realized that if I took the tail off, it'd be a, uh, just a blowtorch. And it was one, one less step when I wasn't trying to imitate a calabatus with it. 
and uh, it worked really well in rivers. So that's how I came to fish this as a river fly. Um, and you can fish it in lakes without the tail or the CDL tail, and I'm sure it'd be good too. But with the CDL tail, it makes a really good uh, calabasas nymph if you put it on a straight chain hook. Um, let's see. Let me scroll back through a couple more here. Okay, talk about using the inverting bead a little if I could. So I use both. Um, I get asked this a lot now, like, do I add lead to my flies or anything like that? These days, what I'm doing is I don't add lead wire to my flies much anymore. What I do is I, I have, I'll do a slotted two millimeter, like if I have on this fly. So in my box right now, um, on the ones I've tied recently, <clears throat> mainly for lower winter water, I have slotted two millimeter uh, versions. I have slotted 2.3 millimeter versions. I have a slotted two and a half millimeter inverted tungsten bead version, a 2.8 millimeter slotted version, and a three millimeter uh, uh, inverted bead version. And the reason why is that the inverted bead for the same general size of bead is about 15 to 20% heavier than a slotted bead is. So I can get really fine increments of weight um, where I can uh, go, you know, up a half a grain or a grain <clears throat> um, from one fly to the next without jumping a full bead size up in a slotted bead, I can kind of get that weight that fits in between. And so for certain water, I really like having the, those increments in weight. It'd be like if you were fishing an indicator, being able to put a size eight shot, you know, to really finely tune your, your amount of weight uh, for certain water. It's the same thing with my beads. I just do it with slotted and inverting beads because they uh, weigh a different amount for the same size flies. Uh, okay, let me scroll back here some more. Okay, why not a loop for the CDC? Well, you could certainly do this one in a CDC loop, and a lot of people would. For me, it's just quicker um, to prepare the feather, put it in a, a clip, and then put it in a loop. It just takes more time. And so doing it straight on the feather like that is just is quicker. And when I'm cranking these out, um, it's I can get more out per unit of time, and that's really it. And as long as I cover that stem with some thread and then I use that extra dubbing behind the hackle to help prop the fibers up, fly ends up looking almost identical because I can just uh, cover over that stem with dubbing. And then I don't have to go through the whole process of making that dubbing loop and <clears throat> uh, worrying about that. And like I say, it ends up looking pretty much the same anyway. Uh, let's see, why am I using CDC instead of hen? That's mainly just for movement. Uh, the CDC is more mobile in the water than the hen is. And okay, I think that's it for now on that stream. And then last uh, question here, any reason I shouldn't use a pink for a tail on a blowtorch? We certainly can. Um, and one of the variations I like uh, that we also sell through Umqua is a uh, purple. Uh, version of a blowtorch, and that has a pink tail on it. Um, I've also tied them in black uh, with like black UVI stub with pink tails on them. So pink can work. I just have in general had uh, really good success with this color variation, the hair color coloration, and a peacock coloration with the original orange, like you see here, instead of the pink. So those are the ones that I tend to favor on those um, color schemes. And then if I get a black one or uh, well, black one is the one I use the pink the most with, but you could, and the, the purple, but you could certainly try it on, on these and see if it works on your local river. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next pattern now. And I believe the next one we have up is the light bright peridigone. <clears throat> and in this video, I'm going to be tying for you uh, a pink variation. And the pink light bright peridigone is um, the, one of the colors that I really like during the winter months. So it's a good one for right now. So in my vise here, I have a finished light bright paradigon and the light bright has been a staple paradigon of mine for, I don't know, four or five years now. And uh, I would say the most popular one's probably the, the peacock or the peacock, peacock black or the orange, but there's um, the, the pink is a really great color scheme, especially for the winter. Uh, this is a, a pattern that is really reliable for me during 
the lower light times of the year and uh, especially the, the colder water of winter, it really just seems to work um, during, you know, December through uh, March really well or November through March. So um, if you're looking for a pattern to add to your winter box, this is one to definitely give a shot. Now, uh, the one I have here has an inverting bead on it. This is a size 20 hook. Um, and with the inverting bead, you can, you know, get down pretty quickly uh, without much um, of a, you know, without a very large bead on the hook. So this is a, a good option if you need some extra weight, but I'll tie one with <clears throat> a smaller two millimeter bead um, for this tutorial. This is, uh, that, that's the kind of the, the correct size uh, that most people would match with a size 20, um, or at least what looks most pleasing to the eye, but you can put, uh, you know, a 2.3 millimeter slotted bead on this. You could put that two and a half millimeter inverting bead like I had in the one in the, in, in the clip there or the, the finished one that I had in the vise. Um, and you could even put a larger slotted bead if you wanted, uh, as long as you can fit it on the hook. Uh, certainly the trout will um, oftentimes take a, a larger bead, even though it may look a little bit funny to our eyes. All right, I just put two millimeter tungsten bead on this uh, hook and put it in the vise. And I'm gonna start with some 16 knot Vivas uh, pink thread. And um, one thing that I like to do whenever I uh, am tying paradigons, I like to have a really good pair of scissors that has a very fine side to the blade. This is some Tiemco razor scissors. They really help to get the thread flush because when you're tying paradigons, it's easy for the thread to stick out. So um, I don't break the thread off typically when I'm tying paradigons in case I get a little fray of the thread that I can't cover up. And then I, I just try and use a pair of scissors that, like I say, gets that thread cut really close to the shank. All right, the first step after covering that shank with thread is to add some tail fibers. So I've got some Cock de Leon here. I'm just gonna measure it to length. I want it about the length of the shank or maybe slightly shorter, but that's roughly about what you want. Do a pinch wrap. <clears throat> so hold those tail fibers in your fingers and uh, like this, just hold them on the shank. Put that thread in between your fingers and it's, there's no tension on it right now. I go under the hook and up back around again and I still don't have any tension on the thread <clears throat> um, yet until I pull up and let it slide through my fingers. And that, that pinch wrap will anchor those tail fibers down directly on the back of the hook and make it so they're in line and not askew. Okay, so now we just need to add uh, some crystal flash. This is pink or UV pink crystal flash. Um, and we're just gonna add one strand. And I just do the same thing. I pinch wrap up, up, up at the front and then slide it back until it's kind of under the wraps of thread. And that, that uh, keeps it from, or keeps me from needing to trim it. All right. Wrap it back to the base of the tails there. You want it flush with the base of the tail. And then, <clears throat> and then I'm just gonna do touching turns on the way up. You'll notice I didn't build much of a body underneath. Um, you don't want a fat body on paradigons. The thinner they are, the quicker they sink. So I've left that body just uh, as a thin layer of thread. Okay, I tie that off and you could finish it just like this. Um, 
but if you want to add a little bit of a hot spot to set it apart in the drift even some more, then I'm changing the thread here to some fluorescent pink UTC thread. You could also use orange. I like uh, orange 16 knot Vetus a lot. And just make sure you've trapped that other thread underneath your thread wraps there. Okay, so then I'm just going to make a three turn whip finish. You don't want to make this hot spot overly large. Okay, so you could cover that in resin now, um, but I do like to add a little point of contrast here in the form of a black nail polish wing case. And normally I would, uh, I just do all my paragons to this point, do, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen of them, um, however many it is that I'm tying in a batch. And then I come back and I, um, I come back and I put resin on them uh, afterward. Uh, but I forgot to, uh, to have one ready to tie or to put the resin on at this point. So I'm just gonna blow on this and try and dry it. All right, we'll see if that uh, nail polish is ready to go. If not, it's gonna smudge a little bit, but that's okay. Okay, I've got some Solar Res Bone Dry resin here, and I'm just gonna put a very light layer. And as I often demonstrate when I'm using this stuff, you don't want too much because you don't want it to be a big glob, and then if you do get extra, just touch the shaft of your of the brush to the shank up near the bead and you should take care of it and it'll remove that extra but that's it that is the finished light bright paradigon in a pink color and uh, give it a shot especially during the winter and see if your local trout like it i know they do around where i live um, and they have across the west wherever i've tried this pattern so uh, it's definitely worth a shot on your local river too. Okay. Um, so not as many questions on that one. Uh, one question here, do, you have, do I have a technique for fishing a deep slow pool in the winter? I know floating the cider is an option, but if more weight than a two and a half millimeter is needed, floating the cider may not work. So, um, the, the answer to that question, if you've seen our film Adaptive Fly Fishing, you will have seen me demonstrate this. Really, most of the time, I just end up fishing a dry dropper um, that uh, ends up fishing like an indicator rig. And then I can adjust the tippet for however much weight I need, and then I can swap back and forth um, constantly if I need to as well. So uh, if I have a two nymph, Euro nymph rig, uh, normally I fish them on micro liters, I can take that tag end and that I have from my upper dropper nymph and just put a dry fly on there and, and substitute it out and it'll end up fishing just like an indicator rig that I can also high stick a long way away. Um, and then I can chop it off, go right back to two nymphs if I need to, or I can leave that, that tag empty if I just wanna fish a single nymph. Um, so that's a really good way to do it. And then if you need some extra length because you're not getting down into that pool, and I can just blood knot some tippet on real quick and take it back off if I wanna uh, move up into some water where, where I don't need it again. Okay. Um, I don't see many paradigon hooks uh, or paradigons on curved hooks. Is this because of the shortage? I'm not really sure what um, uh, that question means. <laughs> I think it may, I'm not sure if it got typed over uh, the same <laughs> as it, what it came in as. Um, I'm not sure why why most people don't tie paragons on curved hooks. I don't really care so much about the shape of a hook, frankly, for my nymphs. I just go through um, and try and use a lot of different styles of hooks in different sizes to see how they hold fish and if they res resist bending. And uh, that particular hook is a really good one in small sizes. It's got a, a heavy gauge wire 
um, and doesn't uh, doesn't bend on uh, on trout even in you know size 18 and 20. So that's why I landed on it with that. Um, uh, so I don't yeah I don't I don't really worry as much about how the shape of the hook makes the fly look quote unquote because I'm not convinced that it really makes a difference in the end for most flies um, to have a different shaped hook uh, on the effectiveness of that pattern. Okay, do I ever use the colored resins or have you found the darker blacks with the nail polish are more effective? Yes, I have found the darker blacks are more effective or, or just better looking. Uh, most of the colored resins I've used have been pretty uh, disappointing, I would say. I've tried the, the black resins and they usually come out charcoal and a lot of times they don't cure all of way unless you sit there and zap it forever because the UV light doesn't penetrate through that opacity very easily. So I don't use a lot of colored resins. In fact, I don't use them at all myself. I just run with the nail polish and uh, the clear resin. Okay. Um, can I talk about what inverting beads do as a generality? We have a few new newbies on YouTube tonight who aren't sure what the deal is. So an inverting bead, um, that's a good question. So the fly I just tied, I had an inverting bead on. And the uh, what what these beads are is they're a tear shop or tear shop tear drop shaped bead, um, so they have an offset of weight, and they if you set them up or glue them up right on your hook, uh, you put them that teardrop opposite of the hook point, and then it'll flip your fly or invert the fly upside down. So you can take any style of hook and make it you know, ride like a jig hook by using an inverting bead. And uh, in addition to that, as I talked about after the last pattern, the inverting beads also weigh more because there's less of the hook missing. Um, the inverting or slotted beads have that big slot missing out of the back of the hook so you can get them over a hook. Inverting beads only have a tiny hole at the bottom. So you have to use them on barbless hooks. You can't use them on a barbed hook because they simply won't go over a barb. But as long as you're doing that, they work great and they pack a lot of weight for the, the size of bead they are. So that, that a uh, bead right there was a two and a half millimeter inverting bead, and it's significantly heavier than a 2.3 millimeter slotted bead, which is basically the same size. So I can get a size 20 hook like that, put a two and a half millimeter inverting bead, and I can actually get down a long ways with that fly with, without needing a really large bead on it. Um, what's my typical winter point fly bead size? I can't answer that. I don't have a typical, I, it changes every single time based on where I'm at. Uh, the current speed that I'm in, the um, you know the depth. Uh, I don't know. For those of you who may have seen my Instagram story from the other day, I just put up a few clips of a bunch of fish that I caught in a short stretch of river. I was fishing one flat going into a, a run um, in this one spot, and I probably changed flies. I don't know six or eight times in that run. I ended up catching a lot of fish out of it. I, I think I landed about. 15 or 16 fish out of it, but I didn't change those flies because I wanted a pattern change all, all the time. I wanted a sink rate change and a depth change. Um, so I don't, that is one lesson I think that most people should learn is that you should be changing flies often if you don't think you have the right sink rate, you know, whether you're either not getting down near the bottom or you're getting there too fast, um, which is just as crucial to your lack of success or, or your success as, you know, um, not having enough weight. So I, I end up uh, changing flies quite a bit if I'm fishing different depths and speeds of water within a short distance of river, whereas if it's fairly uniform um, in, a, you know, in that area, then I wouldn't change flies a lot. But I don't have a typical point fly bead size. I fished everywhere from two millimeters all the way up to a three millimeter inverting bead when every size in between that other day, and it was on a pretty low water stretch of river. Okay, um, is Dave Whitlock's not list super glue method with the sewing needle the best method of creating a leader that will slide through your guides easily? So uh, to that question, I would say go check out my YouTube channel. Um, I have two different uh, super glue methods there. The first one is very much like the Whitlock method. The second one is kind of an updated method that I think works better. And um, then I have another one that's, uh, I show you how to make a micro loop. And that micro loop works better with micro leaders. So it kind of depends upon the specific diameter of leader that um, you're choosing. But the super glue splice 2.0 is what I would tell you to use if you're using 
uh, leader that's anywhere between a 12 pound test, maybe even a 10 pound test butt section all the way up to, you know, standard tapered leader with a 35 pound butt section on there. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. Uh, do I prefer short or long tails on my nymphs? Um, you know, I tied that, that nymph a little bit longer than I probably should have, but somewhere around the length of the shank of the nymph is probably where most of my, my tails land, or maybe slightly longer than the shank. Uh, that would be about right. Okay, so um, we are going to move on to the next pattern now. And I believe that is the straggle stone. So let's get that loaded. And uh, this is the stonefly nymph that um, I use this a lot, uh, especially if there's if it's sl slightly stained water, which you find a lot before stonefly hatches in the summer, just as the water's coming down from runoff and it's still a little bit stained. If you can get a stonefly nymph that has a little bit of flash, a lot of times that works well. Um, and so this is a, a really great stonefly nymph for me uh, just prior to runoff and then just post runoff. I mean, you can fish it all summer long and catch fish on it, but it really seems to work well during those uh, shoulder seasons around runoff or during it if you happen to be out there fishing. All right, let's tie my straggle stone. This is a pattern I've had with Umpqua for a while. And this is gonna be a golden stone version, but you can do it uh, in a darker version for a salmon fly, or you can do it in a cobalt and black, like my magneto version for um, steelhead. It's kind of an attractor trout pattern as well. Lots of things you can do with this fly. So I took a, my, an inverted tungsten bead there and I, put some super glue on the shank and slid it forward upside down. And now that bead is directly opposite of the hook point. So it's a teardrop shaped bead. And when you glue it in place, you want that heavy part of the teardrop, the main body of the teardrop opposite of the hook point. Um, and that's a three and a half millimeter inverting bead. And you can play with whatever size you want You can do these, you know, with a four millimeter bead and a bunch of lead wire, it'll pack a lot of weight. Um, so normally I do my hooks like that, set them up on some cork or foam while they dry and then come back to the one that I started with, like this one right here. And by the time I've done that, it's dry and set and ready to go. The next thing I'm gonna do, uh, you can tie this pattern without any additional weight, but it is a pattern that uh, looks really, really good if you have extra weight on there. So it's, if you need a pattern with a ton of weight for some deep water or something like that, then uh, it's a good one to be able to turn to because you can pack it full of weight without making it look silly like you would with some other patterns. Okay, so all I did was I took some 20 thousandths of an inch thick lead wire Put some super glue on the shank there to hold that in place and that way i don't have to cover it all in thread to bind it down and now i'm going to take some adot rusty done uni thread you could use a little bit darker camel if you wanted especially if you're going to tie a brown version of this and that would be just fine I'm gonna put a little bit of thread on the back there. And now I have uh, some sexy floss. This is tan, amber would be good as well. And I've pre-cut the sexy floss into, I don't know, inch and a half segments here. I find whenever I'm working with rubber legs, I used to hate working with them. And then I realized, you know what? Just trim them beforehand so you don't, they're not gangly and, and uh, getting trapped under everything. And yeah, you might waste a little bit of, of material, but they're a lot easier to work with. So I've, I'll back up and do that again for you. So I've tied it in on the far side of the hook um, and I'm just gonna, I've uh, I bound it down and then I'm pulling the other part of that leg to the near side and I'm gonna trap it and put a couple of wraps down. And right now it's splayed pretty wide. I'm going to leave it that way. Um, it, yes, this is a tail and golden stone tails for one thing aren't that long, but they're also not splayed that wide, but uh, it's there for movement more than anything and that'll work fine. But if you wanted to uh, 
try and narrow those down. You could do it with some material that we're gonna add here in a bit. Next thing I'm gonna do is add some copper wire on here. So this is brassy size in a copper color. You could also do a brown. And then I have some modeled gold skinny skin here. Modeled brown would work well. You could uh, do black or just plain brown for a darker version. And I've cut uh, an angle on the top here. Um, it's kind of like a spear point right now. There's a paper backing on this material, so you gotta trim it. And then by putting that, that uh, angle on the top, it's easier to pull that white paper backing off. So I'm just gonna do that. And now you can see the paper backing's gone. And there's a shiny side and a dull side to this. Um, <laughs> they both, <laughs> but uh, both surfaces kind of look shiny in this light that I have in here. So I'm gonna guess uh, if you want the shiny side up, when you finish the fly, that means you need to put it down as you tie it in. So I think that I have it right where the matte side is facing up right now. I'm gonna tie that down and wind back and this is one of the easier mistakes you can make with this fly is to leave a little gap here. So I'm gonna just lift up and check and make sure that I've got thread all the way back to where those legs are tied in. Cause sometimes if you don't go all the way back then you have just a tiny little gap of thread in there and it's not gonna make it fish any poorer but it just doesn't look very clean. Okay, now I have some gray olive uh, micro straggle string from Hairline and um, this works well. You can also use, sorry, not straggle string. Straggle string is from uh, Semperfly. So yeah, you can use straggle string from Semperfly like this, or um, this is micro UV polar chenille from Hair, Hairline, my bad. Um, both materials work well. The, the polar chenille is a little bit wider, um, has a little bit longer fibers, and the straggle string is a little narrower and has a few more color options. Um, uh, you can do this, you know, in a, a brown micro UV polar chenille for a darker stone. But this gray olive works well for uh, golden stones like this. So I'm going to come forward probably about two thirds of the way or a little bit more up the shank and just put a couple whip finishes in because I'm going to use my, or just a whip finish in because I'm going to use the rotary function here to wind this. UV polar chenille. And I want to do touching turns. It doesn't matter if you build up a little bit of bulk here, so I'd rather have touching turns that maybe go over the top of each other just a little bit than have bare lead wire showing. And I know that um, one thing you're going to think or I'm going to get asked about is, well, if you're using an inverting bead that turns the flyover, why did you put the shell back on the top? So before you... Uh, Ask me that. <laughs> um, there's an easy answer here. I've watched some, I've watched nymphs underwater, first off, when I've been snorkeling for uh, my old job as a fisheries biologist, but I've also looked at uh, flies drifting underwater and they move a lot. They get tossed by current quite a bit, both the nymphs that are natural and the flies. So this fly isn't only drifting in one direction as it goes through the water and um, the, the fish aren't only gonna see one side of it. So by putting it on, up top, I haven't noticed any difference in the, the, uh, the success of the pattern. And it's a lot easier to work with to put this on top than it is to put it on the bottom and have to deal with that hook point when you tie everything in. So um, I still put the shell back up on top, even though it's an inverting bead. And I can promise you, at least from my experience, it hasn't made much difference to the fish. They still like the pattern just as much. Okay, so to put that shell back on, I'm just pulling it forward and I'm gonna tie it down. and wrap this wire through it. And I'm kind of wiggling and waggling it back and forth. And you wanna make sure you get your first wrap a little ways up onto the shank. You don't want it near the back because it can slip off the back of the fly and hit those rubber legs. Um, so make it, you know, your, you, you wanna make your first turn under the fly. So that's why I tied the wire on the far side of the hook and that way, by the time you get up and over the top, you're already a ways onto the material. Okay, oops, looks like I didn't have my vise tight enough here. Okay, so there's uh, three wraps, four, and I'm gonna then 
tie it down where my thread's at. And just go ahead and spin that wire to break it off. And I'll fold that shell back toward the rear of the fly. And I'm gonna tie in another rubber leg here on the near side and I just trap it down with my thumb and put a couple of loose wraps on it and then you can just bind it back to front and front to back. And that is in place the way I want it. And then I just turn it over on, in my vise and do the same thing on the other side. And I can make sure that as I'm doing this on the far side there that I hold the rubber leg in place so that it goes down in the exact spot I want it, at the angle I want it. And now those are nice and splayed out to the side in the configuration I want. And then I'm just gonna tie that straggle string back in place. There we go. And then I'll fold those legs back, do a quick whip finish right there so that that threads out of the way while I use the rotary function and then do the same thing. I'm going to build the body and I'm actually going to go back to the front to begin with to get those rubber legs out of the way with that material and then I can go back. Now if you've ever looked at stone flies, the abdomen is as thick or thicker than the thorax so um, technically that I've probably built up a taper that's not all that natural there but it works well to uh, help shape those rubber legs the way you want. And some stoneflies still have a thorax that's a little bit thicker, so uh, I've run with that and it works well, at least on the water. Okay, tied that polar chenille down. Now I'm gonna pull the shell back over. And one of the things that will likely happen that almost always happens is some of those fibers are gonna get trapped down um, by the thread. Ah, it came out all right. Um, but one thing I wanna do here is make sure that I fold this back and tie it down again. And if you wanna get fancy, you can do that and then either put some dubbing on here um, for one thing, but also you can trim this shell back into a little wing bud. So I can come here and actually make a little notch at the back if I want. And now I've got sort of a, a quote unquote natural looking wing bud from a golden stone. I don't think that matters a lot to the trout, but it looks kind of cool. So you could also just clip it off flush, but you do want to fold it back because uh, if you don't fold it back and put a couple of thread wraps over it, that can slip out and that's one misstep you can make towards the durability of this fly. All right, I've put some super glue on the thread and I'm going to make a couple wraps and then just a quick three turn whip finish. And that's pretty much it. The only thing I'm gonna come in and do is trim out a few of those wayward fibers from the micro polar chenille that have gotten trapped just to clean the fly up a little bit. But that is the finished straggle stone. Uh, one last step there actually is to just even up those legs and make them the length that you want as well if they're a little bit long. But remember that uh, you can't add rubber back on if you've trimmed it off. So start with trimming just a little bit and uh, at a time and then you can make them the length you want. I, I like to leave them longer than um, then, you know, natural golden stones just for some extra movement. But if you want, you can trim them down to more anatomical correctness. Uh, but there's the uh, finished straggle stone, a good golden stone variation. Um, and it's a great pattern uh, as a, you know, as a stonefly imitative nymph, but also it's got enough flashiness to it that it makes a good attractor nymph. They'll definitely pick this out of the drift. Um, from the rest of what's going by. So it'll catch some attention and, and catch some fish for you. All right, hope you enjoyed that straggle stone. Um, 
as a reminder to those of you who might be watching on Instagram, uh, it's only in portrait mode there. And so for a larger flies like that straggle stone and the next one, which is the front end loader, it's gonna look uh, kind of zoomed in and it might cut parts of the fly off. So if you go and uh, watch this on Facebook or YouTube instead, then you can get in the landscape mode and see the whole fly without a problem. Okay, uh, let me scroll back here and see what uh, questions we got. Okay, first one, uh, was Euro nymphing hard to learn? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it is pretty hard to learn for most people. Uh, I started doing it all the way back in 2015. And um, it was a bit of a big change because I came like most of us from being a strike indicator nymph fisherman. I've been doing that for you know, 10, 15 years as a tailwater junkie. Um, and so it was a bit of an adjustment, but um, you know, really the hardest part I think for most people to learn is the cast because you don't have the mass of a line and you have a much different rod and leader configuration. Um, but if you can dedicate yourself to learning to cast well, then the rest of it isn't exceptionally hard. It's not any harder than the rest of fly fishing other than you have to be a little more in tune with your drift and you can't take breaks during your drift because you're affecting everything that your drift is doing as you're fishing. Um, so, you know, your nymphing is not nearly as easy, I think, as a lot of people think that it should be. Um, but it's so darn effective that uh, you, even if you're not doing it perfectly or very well, you're still going to catch a lot of fish. And as you get better at it, you can really become successful. So it's worth doing. Uh, let's see, what packs do I use? I'm assuming that they're meaning my fishing packs. Um, so I currently am using an Umqua, uh, two Umqua packs. So I have a, a hip pack, the Ledges 650 that I wear, and then I also wear a steamboat uh, sling pack on top of that. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I carry a lot of boxes. I have you know, nine boxes and a lot of them have a lot of tungsten in them. Plus I carry a camera um, and you know, want space for lunch and, and maybe a jacket on a lot of days. So um, uh, in it, in addition to that, I have an old shoulder injury in my left shoulder that makes it so I can't put weight there. So chest packs are out of the question for me. I've tried vests and chest packs and everything you can think of. Um, and I can't fish after about 20 minutes because my shoulder screams so bad. So as long as I can get the weight off that left shoulder, then I'm fine. So the sling pack that goes over my right shoulder can carry my lunch and my camera um, so they stay dry. And a, a few of my boxes that I need most readily accessible because it's easier to turn around. And then I carry a lot of my extra boxes that are kind of back up or um, just not used as often in my uh, lumbar pack, the, the ledges. So the Umqua Ledges 650 and the Steamboat are the two that I use. Okay, Facebook question, how do I decide hook gap size when designing fly? I don't really think about hook gap size when I design a fly. What I think about hook gap and hook shape is just about how they hold um, fish. So the only uh, consideration there, uh, I just look, I just test lots and lots of hooks and find the hooks that I, I have the best hook up to landing rate with. And then um, as long as the hook gap on those specific uh, hook styles is good enough that that hook isn't, or that the gap isn't filled by the materials or the bead or something like that that I'm putting on the fly, then I'll roll with it. Um, but uh, I don't worry much about hook, hook gap except for just, you know, whether I land fish on it or not, since uh, all I fish is barbless comp style hooks. So um, having, you know, a good, good shape that I've tested that I get good ratios of hook to landed fish on, that's the most important consideration to me. Um, let's see. Okay, with an inverting bead oriented, the hook rides up. Wouldn't the wing case make more sense on the hook upside? Okay, I talked about that in the video <laughs> specifically because I knew this question was going to come up. Would it make more sense? Yes. Does it matter? No. Um, I've caught fish, uh, just as many fish with the, the shell back on top of the fly uh, with an inverted. The thing is, I've done a lot of snorkeling uh, when I was back as a biologist. And as, when you're under the water, 
and you start looking at nymphs as they're going by, they're spinning around, they're moving, you know, getting jostled by current constantly. And it's not just one side of the fly that's shown to the fish or one side of a nymph that's shown to a fish. And as you're drifting flies, the same things happen. They turn in the current and get tossed around. And um, so, you know, there's a equal chance that a, a, a fish is gonna see that inverted side um, as, as the belly, basically, if it, if it turns in the current. So most of the time it's gonna be um, facing actually with the shell back to them as well. If you have downstream pressure on your tippet from either drag or from you leading your flies a little bit, quote unquote. Um, if you think about an inverted fly and some downstream pressure, then uh, that configuration points that shell back towards the fish. So, uh, but in short, no, I, it doesn't make a difference in the fishability of the fly. So that's all I really care about in the end. Um, so I don't uh, worry about putting the shell back underneath because the shell back is a lot easier to tie onto the fly if you do it on top, because you're not having to worry about um, getting it around your hook point uh, at the beginning step when you tie the thread on. Uh, favorite hooks for it? That one was a Hannock 950. Um, just kind of a long, long shank streamer hook is typically what I use. Uh, is this my most effective stone fly pattern? I've seen my goose buy at stone. I was curious which one you would recommend um, focusing on for stone pattern. So, if the water is a little bit dirtier and I find that the fish want slightly flashier flies, then I use this pattern. And if it's kind of a, a clear late summer type situation, um, then I tend to use that uh, buy it back stone a little bit more. Uh, oh yeah, looks like Sam already <laughs> typed in the answer to that IG question, but I'm glad that, that I covered the, the shell back in the, the video. Um, okay, could this be tied with the dubbing body instead? Any benefit either way? Uh, sure, I mean, as with any fly that you put chenille on, you can always put a dubbing body on it and play around with it and see what happens. I've done both. Um, you get a, a nice, uh, the chenille just has lots of fibers that catch light really well in the sun because they have that flat uh, reflective surface. Um, whereas the fibers dubbing it just doesn't have the same effect. So uh, the straggle string or the micro UV polar chenille um, for this fly just works well because it catches that light. But you can always try dubbing and see how it works for you on your water. Okay. Uh, yep, okay, so I think that's the end of it. Um, and I'll answer Rob Dog's question basically next week because you'll see it. <laughs> uh, okay. The last uh, tutorial I'm gonna do here is for my front end loader caddis. And this fly um, is probably my most overlooked pattern simply because a lot of people you know, recognize or associate my name with Euro nipping. But this pattern is a killer dry fly. And I use this all the time, not only as a fly that um, fish take because they take it a lot, but it design, it's designed to really float dry droppers well. The way that I stack the hackle at the front um, makes it so this fly floats flush in the water, but it's still really buoyant. And if you fish this pattern on a tag, like I do on my leader, um, when I'm holding up a, a nymph anyway, then that hackle really helps support the front end, hence the name, the front end loader, um, and keeps it from looking weird on the water so that it still fishes well when you're fishing it with a nymph um, and will catch fish. Um, I've I caught fish on this fly all the way up into early December this year, even though there hadn't been a caddis around in weeks. So it's it's just a good good fly to uh, to pull fish up. It, it has good pulling power, as I refer to it. You know, gets fish to come toward the fly, even if there's not a hatch on. Uh, but also, um, it works really well when there are caddis hatching and uh, gets a lot of fish. And like I say, it works great as a dry dropper. So. Uh, try it out. It's not the, you know, the easiest fly for a lot of people to tie to begin with, but especially since I switched to doing the span flex type leg instead of having monofilament like I did in my original tutorial on this, it makes it easier to tie and uh, a little more durable as well. So, well, let's load the front end loader cast. What I have in my vise here is my front end loader uh, caddis and 
This is a pattern I came up with at the World Championships back in 2013 in Norway, where I needed uh, a, a caddis dry that could float a dropper because we were fishing a lot of dry droppers at range, but the fish there were pretty willing to come and eat dry flies, but the dry fly needed to, to be flush because we were fishing a lot of flat water and they just didn't want high riding buoyant dry flies. So I, I, uh, one of the patterns that I've liked a lot um, for slightly rough, rougher water when mayfly fishing was the hackle stacker caddis, or uh, sorry, the hackle stacker mayfly, um, which is sort of this, the front of the front end loader is a hackle stacker configuration. Um, and it was inspired by that mayfly, but uh, combined with an elk hair caddis wing because the, the hackle stacker allows this fly to, to float flush but the combination of that with the, the elk hair wing really helps it to be buoyant as well. And I caught a lot of fish, a lot of brown trout on this in Norway, and uh, it became a really important staple uh, of my, my box ever since. Um, it's a, a really good dry fly pattern, uh, both to convince fish to eat on, it, uh, on its own, but also to, to hold up a nymph. So I'm going to put a a size 14 light wire scud hook in the vise here and uh, you can do this on just a straight dry fly as well but i like the protrusion that you get from the curved hook of the the back end of this uh, fly going underwater and i've got some a dot rusty done uni thread here and i'm just gonna Cover the shank full of thread and then come back up about two thirds, three quarters of the way up. And now I have three strands of glow bright floss. And I believe this is number seven this is a fluorescent orange. Um, you could do number five. You can, you could do any number of colors. Um, a lot of people have said, well, why do you put an orange uh, on a, on a cast, don't you know, they're supposed to be a green, but because of the egg sac, well, um, guess what? It's a hot spot. It's not really supposed to be an imitative egg sac. And I tend to favor pink or orange hot spots. I've never really done as well with chartreuse hot spots on, on flies. So that's, you know, what I have on here, but, uh, by all means, put a chartreuse one on here and see how it works for you. And I'm sure it would still catch fish. Okay. So I've tied that down and you notice that I clipped it quite short. I really only need a little bit of a tag there. That's not supposed to, to be a, a big giant tail. It's supposed to just be more of a trigger um, when it comes to the back end of the fly. Okay, now I'm gonna make a dubbing loop here. So I've, I've taken and wrapped it around my thumb and I'm lifting it up and making a, a, a dubbing loop. It's out of the frame here and I'm just gonna wrap that towards the back of this fly. The dubbing loop is not to have dubbing loop put in it. You'll see what it's for here in a second. And then I have some pearl sulky tinsel here that I'm just gonna tie in. Now the dubbing loop I tied in and wrapped back to the hook on the far side of the shank, the side of the shank away from me. And this sulky tinsel, I'm putting it and wrapping it back on the near side towards me. And that is a little bit important if you want to get the tension right when you're looking at the way those two are going to be wrapped. Okay, now I have some tan super fine dubbing. And I'm just going to dub a little bit of that onto the thread here. And... Superfine is particularly difficult to get off the thread if you put too much on because it really likes to stick to it. So add a little bit first and see if that covers the shank for you. And if it doesn't, you can always add more. Looks like I'm gonna need to add a little bit more, but that's okay. I'd rather add more of this stuff and pick it off because it is a pain to pick off. And you can build a little bit of a taper here, but it's not necessary to to build, you know, a lot. Okay, now I don't wanna put any dubbing further forward than that because I need quite a bit of space up here for the wing. The easiest thing to get wrong on this fly is to crowd that head 
with too much wing. So give yourself lots of space. Now I'm gonna wrap this sulky tinsel. So if I'm looking at the front of the hook, let's say I put my head uh, out here to the side and I'm looking at the front of the hook, this wrap is gonna go counterclockwise. So because it was on the near side of the hook um, toward me, then it actually goes under the hook first. And I put all of my first wraps of any ribbing material under the hook first because it tends to protect that material from the teeth of the fish. If you put it over the top of the, the back first, then it's close to the back of the hook and um, that exposes it to fish's teeth where they can kind of cut it and shred it off the back. I find it just is more durable if I make that first wrap underneath the hook. Um, even if it's not fish's teeth, it can still slide off the back of the hook pretty easily if it's on top. Okay, so now I have my Stonfo um, dubbing twister here, which is by far my favorite because you can turn it like that and wrap. It cocks to the side and it's a really easy tool to use. It's not the cheapest dubbing twister by any means, but it, it really is good. So I insert that into the loop and I'm gonna twist it up nice and tight here all the way until the thread is almost touching the tool where it's spun. And then I just, like I said before, I, I, uh, I cock this to the side here and then I can use that to just wrap. And this is gonna go the opposite direction of that sulky tinsel. So it's counter ribbing it, which adds to the durability. So if I'm looking at the front of the hook, then I'm wrapping that ribbing or the thread ribbing as, uh, or in the clockwise fashion. Okay, now I'm gonna make a, th a thread change here. So I had dot Uni uh, that I tied the back of the fly with. I'm gonna switch to some 18 knot Semperfly thread here. This is Brick Beige. And this Semperfly thread is um, really expensive and it comes only on a 30 yard spool. So if I can avoid using it um, any more than I have to, then I will. Uh, but for certain tasks, it's really helpful. So it is a gel spun thread, which is exceptionally strong. You cannot break this. It's 18 knot, it's ridiculously small, but you cannot break it. You can crank on this hook all you want and it's not gonna break. And that makes it great for tying in hair wings. So I've just got some elk hair here and I'm gonna cut off a little bunch. You can experiment with how much you want to cut off here. Um, if you cut off a ton, you can see kind of how much I have there. If you cut off a ton, you'll make a nice buoyant fly with a, a lot of wing, but it's then easier to crowd the front of the fly and the fly itself might not fish as well, or you know, might turn some fish off if you have too much wing. But uh, I play a lot with the, the amount of wing just to increase or decrease the buoyancy. And if I know that I'm gonna be holding up a fair amount of weight, then I make the, the wing fairly bulbous and thick. Okay, I've just stuck it in a hook stacker here. And I'm gonna give it a whole bunch of wax. And now, before I tie that wing in, I'm gonna, I should have done this while the thread or the hair was still in the stacker, but oh well. I'm gonna take and apply some super glue. So that's Loctite brushable that I've just applied some on. That's gonna keep this, this uh, wing durable, but also keep it from spinning. So then I'm measuring it. I want that wing about the length that it's even with the back of that orange tag. And I do a full two wraps around before I put any tension and then lock it down. And then I'm gonna put a whole bunch of wraps near the back of this here. I don't wanna go towards the eye of the fly much because that, that anchors down that hair toward the eye and it's, it makes it easy to, to crowd the eye of the fly but by 
not putting any thread wraps up there, I can get in there and trim out the base of the, those fibers a little bit closer to the eye of the fly and it leaves me more space there. So try and trim this all off flush. Um, you may have to be kind of careful. It's pretty easy to cut your thread if you're not being uh, careful about where you put your scissors in there because that thread is close to the surface of that hair, <clears throat> of the hair. And if you go too um, far into those fibers with your scissors then you can cut that thread. Okay, so now I have the wing tied in and most of the trimming done that I need. There we go. Okay, after I've got my, my wing tied in, I now need to put in a little bit of an indicator post so that I can see this fly really easily. It also adds a little bit of flotation. So I have some pink hair, hairline para post here, and this is about half a strand. So you'll cut it off in a strand and then just kind of remove about half the fibers. And I'm going to tie this down. And then fold back the portion, the waist end that was facing forward and actually tie that down again. So you end up with about the same width as a full strand of this, but it ends up um, being tied down in a way that's a lot more secure than if you just tied a strand in with the ends of it hanging out. That's gonna lock, the, the way I just tied it in locks it down really well and it's not gonna come out. Okay, now I have some flexi floss here or some sexy floss, uh, life flex, lots of different terms for this span flex or uh, spandex type rubber leg. Um, okay, and I, ha I cut one of these strands in half. So they start out at about seven or eight inches and I cut it in half and just paired up the tips. And the tips are gonna get tied down right here. And I used to use tippet for this portion, but I found that it's more durable and easier to work with with the spandex floss than the tippet is. And now I have a size 12 um, hackle here. It came from a whiting 100 pack that was a size 12, but this is a size 14 hook. And so I, I tend to like to oversize the hackle by about a size on this pattern because it helps with the buoyancy. And I actually think it fishes better to have the fibers splayed all, out all over off the front looking like it's gonna be draggled. So uh, definitely don't hesitate to put in hackle that looks a little larger than it should. And now I'm just gonna, after I've tied that in, right at the, up to the base of the rubber leg there, I'm just gonna add a little more dubbing. So this is more tan, super fine. And then I'm gonna cover up the hackle or the hackle and the, the hair at the front of the fly. Try and get it covered as much as I can. There's a little bit of deer hair or elk hair kind of poking through there, but if I do much more, it's gonna make a big giant front end and it might slide the hackle off. So I'm gonna leave it. And to make sure that that dubbing doesn't come off while I do the next step, I'm just gonna throw in a half itch or whip, a one turn whip finish there to hold it in place. And then I can take and I stick my finger inside the loop. This is my index finger on my right hand. I'm sticking there and then I wrap this hackle around that loop. And you'll see I'm putting the loop off the front of the fly while I do this. That makes it easier to wrap and keep it from grabbing the pink parapost. So I wrap out about the length of however long this head is and then I wrap it back down on itself. Um, back towards the base of where I tied it in. And you wanna keep tension with that finger the whole time while you're doing this. And you're gonna put quite a few wraps in there. You can put less wraps if you want less hackle and you don't need as much buoyancy. But uh, I'm holding up droppers with these a lot, so I like to have lots of hackle. And you can put this hackle back in your, if you have a material keeper on your vise for a rotary function, you can just leave it there or you'll have to hold it if you don't. And then 
spit on your fingers a little bit and or get some water in a bowl and stroke those hackle fibers back so they're out of the way do a pinch wrap up here so pinch that thread go around one full turn and then lift up and then maybe do one more and then uh, have some light tension on it and pull up on that loop and that will pull that hackle down and then I'm going to fold those rubber legs back and wrap over the base of them so that it locks them in nice and tight and if it doesn't want to get wrapped over then I'll do a couple more wraps with it facing down and come in and trim those this is probably a, one of the parts you need to be really careful because you want to trim those rubber legs without trimming the hackle fibers. So you couldn't see it on camera there, but I'm using the left, the fingers on my left hand to really guide those scissors into place so that I don't cut something I don't want. Okay. So now I just need to whip finish this. And before I do that, I'm going to add a little bit of super glue to the thread. So this whip finish doesn't come out because the thing about this dry fly is it's an exceptionally dur durable dry fly as far as dry flies go. Um, you can use this same pattern, one pattern for days and catch a lot of trout on it. But if that whip finish comes out in the front, well, you can kiss that fly goodbye. So you might as well do everything you can to keep that from happening. Okay. And this thread being that it's, um, GSP or gel spun thread, it is kind of tough on your scissors, so you may want to actually have an old pair of serrated scissors that will still cut it, but not damage your scissor at all. Okay, then the last uh, step here is just to cut the remainder of the hackle out, and you have to be real careful once again. I don't actually swipe the scissor, I usually just stick my, my scissor points in here and surround the base of the feather and just kind of jab, and that will cut that fiber right off but not, um, it'll cut the quill, but it won't cut the other fibers or the barbels from the hackle. And that is the finished hackle stacker. You can see it's nice and bushy up front uh, and in the back. So, but it still floats flush. So there's no hackle on the bottom here. Um, so it'll float flush with the surface, but it's got lots of, of uh, fibers to help support it on the water if you need to hold up a dropper. And like I say, if, if you know that you're gonna fish this pattern, and not hold up a dropper or hold up a light unweighted or just a two millimeter or 2.3 millimeter bead, then you could get away with dressing uh, the wing and the hackle uh, a lot more sparsely and you might get a few more fish to come up and grab it. But otherwise, um, add more if you need more flotation. And I know that if you uh, give this fly a try, it's a little bit tough to tie it first, but with some practice, you can get it. And if you give it a try, you're gonna catch a lot of fish on this. I've even had uh, fish take it in the middle of the winter. I, I was fishing this a few weeks back in December, you know, long after any caddis hatches were still around. And I, I had a day where I was fishing this in some flats and some glides uh, and pools, and I had half a dozen fish come up and eat this um, on days when they were not rising for any other sort of uh, item. So <clears throat> it's definitely worth the try. I hope you get out there and give it, uh, give it one on your local river. Okay, well, for those of you who stuck around for that pattern, thanks. Uh, I know it's a little bit longer tie, but it's one I love, and it's uh, it's fun to tie once you get used to it, and it's certainly very useful um, as a caddis dry, but also as a dry to hold up a dropper. Okay, let me go back through a couple of questions here. Um, do I prefer uni thread and vivas as opposed to a flatter UTC type thread? If so, why? So. If you paid attention in this video, I actually used Uni for the back of the fly in an ADOT, and then I switched to a, a Semperfly 18 knot gel spun thread for the front of the fly, specifically for the portion where I was cranking on that, that hair. Um, now, uh, and, and basically to avoid breaking the thread. As to your question though, I don't use UTC, uh, UTC thread really at all, um, uh, other than for specific colors. So there's certain colors of UTC that I use as hotspots a lot, just because they make really nice hotspots. But I don't like tying with U UTC mainly because it tends to shred a lot easier um, than uh, Uni or Vivas that are kind of in a, a 
single core, that flatter, you know, filamentous type thread, unless you spin it uh, constantly, which then makes it not flat, tends to fall apart on me easier, um, especially when I'm going to whip finish at the end of the fly. And I don't find it to be as strong for the same denier or diameter um, as the uni or Vivas thread. So no, I don't use UTC thread a lot, unless there's a specific color that, um, they have that I want. And they that is one thing about UTC thread is they have a really wide variety of colors and a lot of colors that are very different than you can get normal thread. So that is one, one reason to, to use it. Um, let's see, what's the smallest I tie the front end loader? I don't really tie this under about a size 16. There's uh, too much stuff <laughs> with the, the wing and the, the hackle stacker steps to really go down to an 18 without crowding everything. Um, so yeah, 16 is the, the smallest that I do, um, let's see. Let me go back through some of the Instagram questions that I already answered, but that way people would uh, be able to hear them on here. Um, let's see. Well, never mind. My feed died, <laughs> so I don't have some of those earlier, earlier uh, questions there. Okay. Uh, there's some other questions here. Fly design, fly design perspective. What is the advantage of a hackle stacker over a parachute? Um, the hackle stacker requires way too many hackle relative to the parachute. Uh, sorry, I tried to remember there. Okay, um, for me, it, it, uh, the the main design um, benefit is that I can stack a ton of hackle on this um, and get a little bit more flotation out of it. Um, then having, and the way that it binds down and comes over, I can spread that hackle out over the front end, the whole front of it, um, and it splays on the water different. With a, a parachute, um, I have to make the parachute post really tall and then make a ton of wraps up and a ton of wraps down to get the same amount of hackle on. Um, and that tends to get in the way, uh, for me at least, with the wing once I start putting that all on there and it just doesn't look or as good. And actually, if you do use the span flex leg, I think the hackle stacker is easier to do than the parachute. Um, would the floatability of the fly be diminished if you use deer hair instead of elk? Well, so as with any um, hair, it's more about the internal structure, how hollow it is. And that can actually depend more upon the section of the animal where they sourced the hair and the time of year that they sourced the hair, whether it was a winter fur or, or a winter hair or, or a summer hair. Um, so there's a lot more, it depends to that question. Deer hair in general is pretty hollow, which is why it flares so much um, and why you can spin it and, and use it for muddlers and other flies like that. So it's actually on, on the whole, I would say probably more um, buoyant than elk hair, but for me, it's a lot less durable when I use it in a wing. It tends to fall off and break off a lot easier than the elk hair does, and so it gets chewed up really quickly, and that's the reason why I, I use elk hair on this pattern instead of deer hair. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, what is the lightest dry dropper rig I can cast on an old for Euro rig? Well, I did it in, uh, in my Instagram store the other day. And actually, if you go to the YouTube video that I just put up on our tactical fly fisher YouTube channel, I use a two millimeter bead under, um, it's not with a, a front end loader because it's a little more wind resistant, but in that video, I had a, a midge dry with a two millimeter bead below it. Um, so you can cast whatever you can work down to. Um, and I, that was another question I got in this feed. What's my favorite Euro leader? Well, it's a micro leader. And if you want to know the dimensions of it, you can go to our uh, film adaptive fly fishing. I have it all detailed there. Um, and basically it's just very thin the whole way through. It's got four X for a butt section. And then you know, I'm using six X or seven X for my tippet. And um, you can, if, if you work on it, you can cast that leader very well, but it takes a lot of work. Um, when I first, uh, started fishing it. It took me probably three months, three months of dedicated practice to get used to casting it because I didn't have anybody to teach me. I was finding it all out on my own. Um, but it actually casts a dry dropper really well if you're patient and uh, make 
energetic forward and back cast and wait for it to turn over, especially on that back cast. And you can do it with pretty light flies as long as there's you know, not a lot of wind or something. Um, let's see. Okay. How big do I tie it? Okay, so um, I tie it down to a 16, but I will tie this up to a size 10. Um, and even though there aren't, well, I mean, if you have October caddis around, a size 10 is pretty appropriate, and maybe even bigger than that. But uh, the main reason I have it that large is in case I need to float a really heavy nymph. So that was one of the um, questions on Instagram that I forgot that uh, got cut out of my feed, <laughs> um, is uh, what range of flies do I put under this as a dropper, or at least what size of beads? Um, if you're fishing a size 16 in this, you can probably uh, fish up to a two and a half millimeter bead. Uh, if you're fishing a 14, you can get away with a three millimeter bead. If you're fishing a 12 and it's really heavily dressed, you could put a three and a half millimeter bead under this, but it's certainly a size 10 would hold up to three and a half millimeter bead. And as long as you have um, some, uh, you know, like frog's fanny or other powder, uh, like uh, Timco dry shake, something around that is a desiccant, you can, uh, Treat it every every few you know every twenty minutes or so if you're not catching fish on it, um, and keep it really buoyant and hold up some extra weight that way. And as, especially if you're fishing this on a euro leader with a nymph instead of mending it on the water like you do with a normal leader, um, then you can float more weight because it's those mends a lot of times which end up pulling the fly under. So if you can high stick it like you would with a euro leader or make your mends really light if you're having to float a cider or something, and it won't pull the dry fly. Um, uh, another question here, how many variations do I go through before setting on, settling on a finished fly usually? Oh, I don't know that I ever settle on a finished fly. <laughs> um, I'm always playing around with something different. Uh, even if it's a really long established pattern, I might change some thread or some dubbing or, you know, this or that. Um, but it just depends on how well it works the first time. If I go out with a fly and it's a, it's a killer first trip, I might leave that variation in the rotation for a long time. Um, but if it's not as good as I expect it to be, then I'll start playing around with it. Um, okay, My, yeah, so um, I think that's all the time questions I've got at least on the feed right now. Um, but you can find this video later. Uh, Umko is going to post it directly to YouTube. They're also going to have the tutorials um, by themselves later on as well on individual flies. And then I'm going to do several of these tutorials um, and have my own video I'm going to put together with them. That you can find them later on my blog and our YouTube channel at Tactical Fly Fisher. And there again, uh, if you want to find me, this is our business, tacticalflyfisher.com, um, where we specialize in lots of uh, sort of competition fly fishing related gear and, and uh, techniques. We teach you how to use it and then um, hopefully it goes out there and, and helps you have success on the water. Um, and then uh, next week they have another one with uh, these uh, live stream sessions with Doug McKnight. So check that out. Um, uh, I can't remember if it's Tuesday or Wednesday next week, but it's at seven o'clock again. So you can uh, look on the Umpqua web. Uh, schedule for that. They'll have it on their um, their socials. Um, so um, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate everybody coming. And oh yeah, and Tuesday is Doug McKnight's uh, tying session. So I, I, I really appreciate everybody uh, coming and watching tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope you're having fun and success out there on the water this winter. And uh, that's it. Toodaloo. Catch you next time. See you in the next video.